Hey, welcome, First Baptist. We're here to worship the Lord today in spirit and in truth. We pray that you join with us. Let's sing this great song. This is amazing grace. for all you've done for us. We thank you for being with us as we uh, worship you, Lord, even though not uh, physically together, spiritually we are together in one accord, giving you praise and giving you glory. Help us to do this, Lord, in a way that would be pleasing to you, that would bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, as you know, we're about to step into uh, uh, 
the week before the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We celebrate that, that great day. And, and so today is Palm Sunday, and we'll be thinking about the cross. And uh, this uh, next great song really uh, helps us focus on that. It's, it has a unique beginning. It says, I cast my mind. I cast my mind on Calvary. Well, you know, the Bible says something about putting our mind somewhere. In, in Psalm 1, uh, 2, it, it, it reminds us that we are to meditate on the Word of God. Amen? And in, in, in thinking about the truth of the Word of God, thinking about what Jesus did. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this song. And, and so you just sing with us with all of your heart and worship the Lord today, all right? I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see His wounds His hands His feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone oh give me praise
this next uh, song, I hope you know it and love it. It's uh, how deep the Father's love for us. And as we think about that, the second verse takes my mind back to a, uh, a picture that was a logo of a, uh, uh, an evangelistic uh, emphasis that we did here at church back in the late 90s, uh, faith evangelism. And in that picture, you'll see that the perspective is not looking at Jesus on the cross, but it's looking at the people who are looking at Jesus on the cross. And on the, their faces, you see shock and grief and shame, etc. And that's really our faces, isn't it? Because it was our sin. Let's meditate on the fact that it was our sin that Jesus had on him on that cross. Let's sing together how deep the Father's love. Sing it, why should? Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. guilty with nothing to say and they were coming to take me away but then a voice from heaven was heard that said let him go and take
Today is Palm Sunday, the day when Jesus made his entrance into Jerusalem for the last time, climaxing with the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We all uh, can hear those words echoing in our minds from Matthew 28 when they're looking for Jesus and the angel says, He is not here, for he has risen. What a wonderful climactic end of what we might call Passion Week, which ends in the celebration of resurrection. Every gospel writer records and expounds upon what we call the triumphant entry or triumphal entry of the Lord into the city of Jerusalem. For this reason, uh, we celebrate Palm Sunday in the church, and it holds a special place in all of our lives. If you know your Bible history, you will remember that Jesus... And his disciples were on their way from Jericho to Jerusalem. When they approached the Mount of Olives on the east side of the city, Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead to fetch a stranger's donkey that had never been ridden so that he could ride it into the city of Jerusalem. You can find that story in all of the gospel accounts. Matthew 21, Mark 11 Luke 19, and of course, John chapter 12. We have been studying the Good Shepherd out of John chapter 10. And it's my desire today to connect John 10, verse 11, with the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, or we may call it Palm Sunday. And what we're going to learn is that the Lord Jesus Christ is not only the Good Shepherd, he is actually the shepherd king. What kind of king is he? Well, he is a shepherd. And according to John chapter 10, verse 11, where we left off last week in verse 10, verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, in John's account of the triumphal entry, listen what it says in John 12, 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. 
And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, and they continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. You find here that the disciples went before him. And we get commentary from John that the disciples did not understand at first what was going on. And we might call these the aha moments of scripture. When after things took place, they thought back on it and said, yes, it was written about Jesus that he would actually do this. It's kind of like reading a good novel. In the early chapters, you wonder why the character does this or that. You're introduced to uh, different aspects of the person and what he did. But when the last chapter unfolds, everything falls into place. The lights go off in our minds, and we begin to think about this. And so there must have been hundreds of aha experiences. Consider for a moment the kinds of questions in the minds of the disciples when they're told to go out and fetch this donkey for Jesus. Lord, we're only one mile from the city. We've walked this far. Why not just walk the rest of the way in? Look, Jesus, you just can't walk up to any stranger and say, hey, my master needs your donkey. He's going to think we're nuts. Uh, Look, Jesus, you can't get on a donkey no one has ever ridden. You'll make quite a fool of yourself and a spectacle. What if you get bucked off? In spite of that, and you know questions had to enter their minds because they did not know what Jesus was doing until after it. All these questions probably filled their minds. But here's the amazing thing. They obeyed the master. They did exactly what the Lord told them to do. And one hour later, Jesus mounted the animal. He rode it into the city of Jerusalem. And the remarkable thing is the response of the people. Seeing Jesus come through the gate in a spontaneous gesture of homage They took off their cloaks, they spread them on the ground, they pulled palm branches out of the palm trees, they waved them back and forth, and they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The king has come, the king of Israel. Now obviously, to them, this was a moment of deliverance. Hosanna means save us, please, Lord. They looked upon Jesus as the one spoken of in Psalm 118. Verse 25, we saw this last week. And the verse says, Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send prosperity. Perhaps the main thing they were thinking about in view of deliverance was deliverance from Rome. That's highly possible because the very same ones that were probably crying that day, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, were the same, in the name of the Lord, were perhaps the same ones that were ready to pick up clubs and saying, crucify him in the end. We get this. Another remarkable thing is the, that Jesus Christ himself accepted the accolades as he came into the city. And that worried the Pharisees. And what have we learned about the Pharisees? They were the bad shepherds. It, it really bothered them that his notoriety was spreading. So, this could mean trouble for the Jews in regard to the Romans. So when they tried to stifle their spontaneous outbursts. Do you remember what Jesus did? He cut them off. And he said to them, These people, if these people will not cry out, then the stones will shout. Have you ever wondered about Jesus' actions on this first Palm Sunday? What was he doing riding on a donkey and then threatening the peace of the city? Coming in as a king... In order to grasp this significance, we must go back to a very obscure passage in the Old Testament. That passage is going to give us a visual picture of the scene that's described in all four Gospels called the Triumphal Entry. I want you to know that what Jesus did was absolutely intentional. And it was signaling his role and his ministry. And that's where we pull together king and shepherd. Or shepherd king is the fact that the king is coming 
But this king is going to lay down his life for the sheep. What does this passage, passage teach us about our God? What kind of king is this? This passage over in Zechariah, if you will make your way there. Zechariah chapter 9. It divides into two unequal parts. In verses 1 through 8, you have given to us a prophecy and an understanding of the nature of the Lord's kingdom. And this is not an easy read. And I'm not going to read 1 through 8, but perhaps you can at home this morning. But these are difficult verses. And as you read through them, you may not grasp exactly what's going on. But let me just break down the nature of this kingdom that the king is going to serve in. It will be a kingdom established by the Lord himself. It will be triumphant over all its foes. And it will take into it people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. What an amazing prophecy it is. When you get to verses 9 through 11, it's going to deal with the king of this kingdom. What will the king look like that will serve? And this picks up the outline that you have before you on the screen, uh, talking about Jesus, our good shepherd, what kind of king is this? Now listen to verses 9 through 10 of Zechariah 9, and it will introduce the first point to our sermon, the shepherd king that will serve. The Bible says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So you see there on a colt, the foal of a donkey is direct fulfillment, of uh, a di direct prophecy of what will be fulfilled in the triumphal entry. So let's break this down before we go back to John 10. Let's break this down. The shepherd king that will serve. The first thing is that he will be Zion's expected king. Your king is coming to you. Who are they looking for? Well, most would say David is back, right? Because that was the prophecy in the Old Testament, that there will, there will be a king upon your throne forever. At this time, the house of David, however, was in decline. The house of David was in decay on the surface. There seems to be absolutely no hope. So Zechariah proclaims the promise to David that it will be accomplished. A king will be installed to rule forever. Restoration is on the way. Now, he is not a Nero who fiddles while Rome burns. He is not an Ayatollah that shames his citizens. He's the kind of king that will make the daughter of Jerusalem, the offspring of Zion, leap for joy. Children will sing Hosanna. Old men will dream dreams. Slave girls will prophesy. The blind will see. The lame will walk. The deaf will hear. The lepers will be cleansed. The poor, the Bible says, have the good news preached to them. The king is coming. So the shepherd king that will serve, first he will be Zion's expected king. But notice this, he will be a righteous king. Your king is coming to you righteous. What an amazing word. He will be a righteous king. He will rule, in other words, according to God's standard or, or the standard of God's will. He will stand victoriously on the side of the right. The Hebrew word speaks of the Lord's own personal righteousness. He is righteous in himself. He holds within himself moral uprightness, spiritual perfection, and legal righteousness. In other words, he alone fulfills the righteous standard of God's law, something no one else on earth could ever do. He is Zion's expected king. He will be righteous. And notice this phrase, and having salvation is, is he. I have worded that in your outline he will be rescued. Now, this is interesting. The New King James Version says having salvation uh, as something that the Lord gives. And truly, he does come 
giving salvation. The NASB says endowed with salvation. The NIV says having salvation. But the literal Hebrew word is saved. Now think about this. Behold, your king is coming to you righteous and saved is he. But to call the Messiah saved is strange. And as I learned in Old Testament preaching from Dr. Daniel Block, that caused translators just to struggle accepting the Messiah being saved. But in actuality, it refers to having been saved from some kind of ordeal. A king who needs to be saved. Zechariah is talking about one who would be delivered by the Lord. And if we are Sunday's children, which I hope you are, then you know exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about the glorious resurrection. The king riding on a donkey will be treated in such a way that he needs to be saved, not from his own sin, but from ours. The scourging, the crown of thorns, the hanging suspended between heaven and earth was all because of the price that he paid. Peter, in his sermon in the book of Acts, seven or eight weeks after the death and resurrection of Jesus, he says to the crowd in Jerusalem, you killed Jesus by the hands of lawless men, but God raised him up, having loosed the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. In other words, God saved Jesus, brought him up forth from the grave. He will be rescued forth. He will be humble. And I think this part connects to John 10, 11, uh, straightforward. Listen, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the, f- the foal of a donkey. He will be humble, meek and lowly, as opposed to proud and haughty. So this is emphasized by his entrance into Jerusalem, riding on a colt. Kings, what do you know about them? They're normally rich and they're proud. They have all the pomp and circumstance. But this one will be meek and lowly. He will be identified with the people. He will not come riding on a royal stallion, but riding on the foal of a donkey. And what do we know? A borrowed one at that. Israel's king comes in humility and gentleness, bringing salvation, bringing peace. So Zechariah 9.9, you can see how significant this is. As a matter of fact, Zechariah 9.9 is one of the most significant messianic passages found anywhere in the scripture. What the humility of Jesus means is that he is willing to be so afflicted and so abused and so defeated to save mankind. What a savior we have. What a shepherd king. Fifth, he will inaugurate a reign of universal peace. Notice the end of verse 10. His rule... He'll speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This king who came in humility, riding on a donkey, a colt, into Jerusalem some 1,975 years ago, take a few, riding on a donkey of peace. We know now that he reigns in heaven and commands peace to all nations. His reign began humbly in Jerusalem. But then the Bible tells us that it spread to Judea and then to Samaria and to the other ends of the earth. His reign goes beyond the borders of Israel. Christ will proclaim peace to the nations through the work of his cross and resurrection. Now I hope at this point you see the significance of Jesus saying, go fetch me a donkey. I am the legitimate king. He knew exactly what he was doing when he told them to do it. He knew what they would do to him. When he got to Jerusalem, and he knew the ultimate triumph of God. He knew that he would be victorious. He knew that he would be rescued. He knew of the resurrection. So I am the legitimate king installed by the Father. Now listen, that brings us to this question, what kind of king will he be? We saw that he came in like this. He is the king. But what would he actually do? And then back over to John. Certainly won't hurt us to read it again. Listen to this. John 10 Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. We use numerous Old Testament passages to strengthen Jesus using this particular image at this particular time. We know that the backdrop is John 9 where you have false shepherds mistreating the sheep and putting them out of the synagogue. And then you have Jesus making this uh, wonderful I am statement. 
that he is the good shepherd. So the background reveals that he alone is the good shepherd. He gathers his sheep through the door as they enter into salvation. The Jews standing there that day would have accused him of blasphemy. As a matter of fact, a little later in John, they're going to pick up stones and try to kill him. In their minds, there was only one good shepherd, and he was Yahweh God, or Yahweh our covenant God. So think about this. The king who's coming into Jerusalem in chapter 10 of John, the king coming into Jerusalem in chapter 12 is the very shepherd in chapter 10 that's talking before the Pharisees and all who would hear that he was the good shepherd that would lay down his life for the sheep. So he was claiming to be Yahweh God himself, fully God, fully man, yet willing to lay down his life for the sheep. And I'm sure that you've read this verse many times in your life. I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. It is remarkable. We might say it this way. It is a remarkably profound scripture. You can't read it like you read the newspaper. You can't just breeze over it. What is he conveying to us in saying that I lay down my life for the sheep? The contrast, again, is between the good shepherd and the worthless shepherds who desert the flock. The phrase, lay down my life, is not a case of merely risking one's life, but actually surrendering the life into death. Uh, is similar to Mark 10, 45. You know this verse. Jesus said, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and check this verb out, and to give his life a ransom for many. In this particular passage, Mark 10, 45, it catches more of the central part of I lay down my life because the verb here means in the stead of or expe- expresses both the benefit and substitution. In other words, he's going to die in the place of his sheep. Much like we were singing, um, I should have been crucified. And the Father's love for us. Uh, it is exemplified in the fact that he would die as a substitute. He's conveying redemption. He's speaking of atonement. Let's talk about what this means in light of the fact that this is Palm Sunday. And we've put it together with Zechariah 9. He is the king, but he's also the shepherd. So our first point, we are reminded that he is the shepherd king that will serve. And then what does his service look like? Well, the second thing is the shepherd king surrenders his life to save his sheep. And I've noted for you where that's found in John 10. It's found in John 10, 11a, 15b, 17a, and 18 A, he is the shepherd king who surrenders his life to save the sheep. What does that mean? What does it mean for us to contemplate? How will he serve? What does it mean for him to say, I'm going to lay down my life for the sheep? Let me give you a few things to think about on this Palm Sunday as you're gathered there with your family, thinking about this particular week leading up to Easter Sunday and the glorious resurrection, thinking about Uh, This Sunday, Palm Sunday, leading up to Passion Week, which began Monday, Thursday, and leading to Friday in the crucifixion and resurrection. What is he doing? First, Jesus is the sacrifice for our sins. John the Baptist would say it this way, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What was the Lamb? It was a symbol in the Old Testament of sacrifice. It was a symbol of substitutionary sacrifice. By Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd and I lay down my life for the sheep, he was saying, I will sacrifice myself for my sheep. Jesus is the sacrifice for our sins. Second, Jesus accomplished our redemption. The word redemption or redeem means to buy, to purchase, to redeem. In laying down his life, he would redeem for himself a people of his own. He would walk straight into the slave market of sin, as it were, and he would put down the purchase for the slaves. He would then buy them out of the slave market and make them his own. He would make them slaves of righteousness. So Jesus would sacrifice for our sins. He would accomplish our redemption. But he would also propitiate the wrath of God. Jesus propitiated the wrath of God. Now, we don't use that word very often, do we? Propitiation. 
but it is a wonderful biblical word. When the good shepherd of the sheep laid down his life for the sheep, what did he do? Well, Jesus propitiated the wrath of God against us. Jesus, in laying down his life, bore the brunt of God's wrath for those to whom he would die. We should never make a mistake at this point regarding our own sin. Our sin brings out the wrath of God. There is not a sin that you or I could have ever committed that doesn't fall under the watchful eye of our God. We should look at every single sin that we ever committed as adding to that cup of wrath that we should have taken, that we should have drank every single drop of it. Each sin added more to this cup of wrath. Make no mistake about it. We had filled the cup to the brim. I sensed this clearly listening to the word of God preach and filling myself under the holy indictment of God and his wrath when I was nine years of age. Have you ever sensed the fierce wrath of Almighty God against your sin? Justice said, Philip Burden deserves to drink the cup of wrath. I deserve to drain the wrath against myself to the very last drop. But mercy said, Jesus Christ will drink the cup for me. Because of Jesus laying down his life to propitiate the wrath of God against me, I will never taste one drop of the wrath of God. Hallelujah. That's good news. If you're saved today and you belong to the Lord, it's only because the Lord Jesus Christ propitiated the wrath of God that was against you. The good shepherd endured the wrath of God for those he would save. So think about this. I will lay down my life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I will be the sacrifice. I will accomplish their redemption. I will propitiate the wrath of God, the Father, against them. Number four, Jesus reconciled us to God. The Bible says we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We've all gone after our own way. Uh, Isaiah 53, 6 is a wonderful verse of Scripture that reminds us of this. And it's found in the suffering servant passage of Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Now, I think the phrases, we've turned everyone to his own way, we've gone our own way, is this not actually seen in the lives of the smallest of children? It doesn't take a whole lot of effort to get a kid to go their own way. And you know, and I know, if you've got children, this is expansive, is it not? This expands as the children grow older. Uh, we actually probably do a disservice at times to think that when they do these things, it's awfully cute, isn't it? But I want to remind you that sheep that go astray are not cute. As a matter of fact, they're in need of redemption. The breach in our relationship, why do we need to be reconciled? Because of the sin of Adam. Adam sinned as our representative. And we can say, well, that's not fair. Well, Romans chapter 5, verse 12 clearly teaches us that the sin of Adam was imputed to us. Just as the righteousness of Jesus is imputed to us, thus also the, right, the sinful nature of Adam was imputed to us. We thus are alienated from God through Adam's sin. That terminology is not popular in our day. We want to think that we're all neutral and that we just kind of put it in the forward motion, and we're good. We move our way to God. But that's not what the Bible teaches. It doesn't teach that we are neutral. It teaches that we are alienated from the life of God. We come into this world as strangers and aliens to God and the very God who made us. So outside of Christ, the Lord declares, as surely as I live, my glory will not be trampled on by anyone, and I will vindicate my justice. Aren't you thankful that Christ vindicated that justice for us in our salvation by saving us. There is an interesting phrase in the Bible that's always amazed me. It says that Abraham was a friend of God. Now the question that comes to mind is how do you become a friend of God like Abraham? Well, Abraham did so by faith. By faith he was reconciled to the Lord, which before Abraham was a sworn enemy to God. And yet the Bible says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him. There's some of that great theological terminology to reckon to his account righteousness. So through the good shepherd, 
laying down his life. We, at one time, the enemies of God, are reconciled to God. This phrase, lay down my life, is absolutely loaded. But here's the deal. The key element in all of this is the word substitution. The good shepherd stood in the stead of his sheep. The sheep should have been taken to the slaughterhouse of judgment. But the good shepherd stood in their stead. The good shepherd was the sacrifice for their sins. He laid down his life to redeem them. He bore the wrath that we deserved in order to reconcile us to God. Let me share with you a passage that kind of brings all these truths together for our edification. It's just good to read the Bible, isn't it? Romans chapter 5. Just listen to how it brings together sacrifice, redemption, propitiation, reconciliation, all in one set of scriptures. Romans 5, 6 through 11. The Bible says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now received reconciliation. Praise the Lord. Everyone needs a shepherd. Amen. John 10, verse 16. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them in also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock and one shepherd. Do you know that that is a fulfillment of Ezekiel 34, 23? God says to the people, I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. And then a little later he tells us who that shepherd is, my servant David. And we've learned that David was off the scene. Who was this? Well, it was the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the promise of the future shepherd king in the mold of Psalm 23. My servant David, putting together both motifs of, of shepherd and king after the mold of Psalm 23. We should connect this as well to another rich messianic prophecy, and that's found in Micah 5, 2 through 4. What does it promise? That out of Bethlehem, the house of bread, will come one whose goings forth are from everlasting. The Bible says he will stand, listen, and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. When we connect this, you have a shepherd king who is God and man. Here is the shepherd that we all need for life and eternity. Why do you need such a shepherd? Again, I've told you from the Old Testament, but let me show you in the New Testament. First Peter, again, we're reminded of our need for our shepherd. Wonderful words. First Peter chapter 2, verse 25. Let's read 24 and 25 of First Peter chapter 2. The Bible says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Both one article is governing two nouns, right? The Bible says, For you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to one article, the. The shepherd and the overseer is the same person. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is the shepherd. Christ is the guardian of our souls. Here's the deal. You can trust your soul to the shepherd king. Christ is shepherd and guardian of our souls. Jesus did not die simply to be an example or simply to demonstrate even the depth of his love. Now hold on to that because some of you are thinking, what do you mean? Well, he died because his sheep are in real danger. 
That's why he died, ladies and gentlemen, because the sheep are in real danger. He died in our place, and by his death and resurrection, we are saved. Allow me to give one final amazing promise to the Lord's sheep. Now, this is to the people who are already saved. Your sheep, listen to how, again, this imagery is brought in in the last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 7. If you'll make your way there, this is worth putting your eyes on. Precious promise found in the last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 7, beginning in verse 16. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to the springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. What a promise. This is our good shepherd. This is our great shepherd. This is our shepherd king who will receive and lead and love and care for all who will say, The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. To God be the glory. Father, we come before you today and we just we, we stand amazed at the beauty and grandeur and trustworthiness of your holy word. Father, thank you so much for speaking to us through your word. We hold in our hands when we have the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, the very word of God to us. This is what you have written. This is what you're saying to your people. And Father, we thank you for how we can connect the dots of your glory. To think about Palm Sunday and to think about you having your disciples go before you and fetch a donkey in perfect fulfillment of Zechariah 9. And then, Lord, what was on your mind as you entered Jerusalem for the last time? It was going to climax in your death on the cross for our sins. Lord, it was going to climax in the resurrection of Jesus Christ wherein you vindicated you were vindicated in that once-for-all sacrifice before the Father. That sacrifice was accepted. And Lord, we thank you today that we stand before you as righteous uh, in your eyes, all because of Jesus. We thank you for the sacrifice you made. We thank you for your propitiation on our behalf that you appeased the wrath of the Father against us. Father, we are so thankful that we will never, ever stand under the condemnation an indictment of a holy God, all because of Jesus, all because of the fact that we believed in the life, death, burial, and resurrection. We put our faith in the Lord Jesus as the object of our salvation, the only one who saves. Now, Father, may you speak to hearts that have heard this sermon. And for Christians, Lord, encourage us during these days of the coronavirus and remind us that you have overcome the world. Peace you give to us, not peace that the world gives. But, Lord, we understand what that peace is. It's peace that we have with you because we've been reconciled to you. And we belong to you. We're the sheep of your pasture. Thank you, Father, for that wonderful truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.